Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. In a 100-mile race, when do you expect to notice a difference in your perceived effort? When do things start feeling real difficult? How much heart rate drift do you get? And when relative to your longest training runs, James, that's from James Robert. Okay, so I'll answer this one as best I can. There is some kind of... uh, individuality here where it's not like going to necessarily always click for everyone the same way. So first of all, I think what we want to do is step away from thinking of this idea that the perceived effort in a hundred mile race is just going to, in a linear manner, get progressively more difficult. You'll never find a hundred mile performance. uh, I shouldn't say never, but you'll be very unlikely to find a hundred mile performance where every mile just gets slightly more difficult to the point where like mile one was the easiest mile hundred was the hardest and everyone in between kind of just fell in line. Uh, it just doesn't really work that way. You'll have like ebbs and flows where you, you might find yourself 20 miles in feeling like, Oh, the effort's a little harder right now than it felt before. And then 10 miles later, you might feel better than you did at the starting line. Uh, you could have a situation where like, at mile 70, you hit a rough patch in your previous race. So your mind is hyper-focusing on that and can drive you into kind of like expecting it to happen and therefore producing that, that sensation. So there's a lot of like things, a lot of moving parts going on here with this particular thing, but I think there are things you can do to help smooth that out as much as possible. So you don't feel like you're on a roller coaster ride all day or feel like, you know, the last 20 miles of the hundred mile was like half the day in your mind. And some of those are just accepting that it's not linear because if you find yourself uh, partway into a race and things are getting more difficult, if you start thinking it's going to get worse progressively, you're going to spin yourself into such a mental negative feedback loop that it will get more difficult. And you'll likely drop out if that happens early enough or just have a really rough go of it. So recognizing that it's not linear and that if things do start feeling bad, that they will get better if you take care of yourself and properly kind of focus, then you'll get through that low and you may feel great. And your perceived effort will likely feel like it comes down. Like all of a sudden now you're moving along, maybe at a faster pace, feeling like it's even easier than it did uh, four miles ago. And this is the thing that I think is oftentimes the most intriguing for ultra marathon runners is because when they get that experience, everyone they talk to has had that experience as well. And they're just, it's like this weird thing that doesn't make sense in your head. Cause how can continuing the activity that got you there in the first place actually feel better after a while? It would, you, it would, it feels like it has to progressively get worse. Uh, personally, I think a lot of times when people consistently struggle at the end of a race where it feels like things is really getting much more difficult for say the last 20, 30 miles than they do the rest of the race is because of pacing. Uh, a lot of times the ultra marathon running community, I think gets into this headspace of they have a race where the end is just infinitely more difficult than the beginning. And they, assume that that is the reality. Like there's no way around it. It's always going to feel much more worse at the end, the beginning. Therefore I need to bank miles while my legs are fresh. And it's really, really tempting to do this. Everyone's fallen for it. It seems like if you do enough of them, you've fallen for this. I've fallen for it many times where you feel good in the beginning and you're like, okay, I'm just going to bank a few miles here while I feel good. Therefore, when I start feeling crummy at the end, I'll have some, some money in the bank, so to speak. And you can cash that in when balance it out with your slower miles. If you try to more evenly pace or sustainably pace a run or go into a hundred mile of thinking, I could actually run faster in the second half than the first half versus this mentality where it's inevitable that you're going to slow down. That's when you put yourself in a position where you could possibly actually feel better at the end. And if you pace yourself properly, then you, you, you're more likely to find yourself in that position. So I get that that's really difficult, especially for a hundred miles, because you're just not going to do a training run that is going to get anywhere near that in almost any case, unless you're just doing a ton of racing and your last hundred mile was in close proximity. But I think anytime you go into a race outside of races where there's certain elements that 
really impact the pace you can run like say heat let's say it's a race where it's really cool in the morning and blistering hot in the afternoon and then maybe cool again in the evening i can see some justification for moving a little quicker during those cooler periods because there's just going to be less logistics to manage you're not going to have to slow down to to stay cool as much as you may would have maybe would have to in the afternoon and there i think banking miles isn't as big of an issue but you still have to be working within a reasonable range there so you don't find yourself in rough spot during the heat of the day because now you're going to be getting hit with like the fact that you went out too fast as well as the increasing temperatures so i think you need to be mindful of that as well uh other things to think about along the way with this is nutrition caffeine and hydration okay so if you are not defending muscle glycogen your perceived effort will likely go up. So the, I can't, I think it was Dr. Mike Nelson, when he was on the show, we talked about this a little bit where when you get to a point where your muscle glycogen is a right around 40% is when your body starts kind of increasing your perceived effort at a given pace. And that is uh, just your body's way of saying, Hey, we're starting to kind of get a little lower in this fuel source and we want to make sure we're preserving the 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 remainder for things that are going to be a little more important than your race day and your body's mind uh then you may start seeing that so if you're if you're not defending glycogen enough to stay above that marker you may feel that perceived effort kind of increase as your body fights to 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 kind of release some of the fuel that you'd maybe want to kind of keep moving at the pace at the, the perceived effort that it felt at the beginning of it. So kind of, you know, paying attention to making sure you're getting your nutrition in, in a timely way and not falling way off on that can be big. A hydration kind of fits in the same, same realm with that. You think about it. Like if you're just, if once you hit certain points of dehydration, you know, your blood volume is going to drop and those. That's the, you know, that's, that's, what's going to be help you, be running efficiently. So if you're behind on fluids and electrolytes and things like that, your body may also increase perceived effort because it just has finite supplies to keep doing the activity you're trying to get it to it. Now you add on top of this, everything that comes along with it, sleep deprivation, like we talked about in the previous question, just time on your feet, your legs are getting tired, just relative mental bandwidth wearing out. I like to talk about these hundred mile races as like there, are, this is a physical component and there's a mental component. And I think you can drain both of them. And if you find yourself in a position where you're, uh, you're fighting a lot of mental, mental demons, cause you went out too fast and you're progressively getting slower or, you're constantly thinking about how heavy your legs feel because you are under hydrated or under fueled or something like that. These things are going to all compound. So it's why I think a lot of times when ultra marathons go bad, they go really bad because it's not just, it's maybe one thing drove it, but that one thing kind of compounds into other things that also slow you down. And that becomes more exponential at that point. So hitting your defending your muscle glycogen, which is going to be different from person to person. We've talked about this on the show before, where I like to kind of put everyone in the same camp where we're all defending muscle glycogen, regardless of whether you follow a diet like mine, which is lower in carbohydrates or even lower than be a strict ketogenic diet. Or if you're a moderate high carb athlete, either way, you need to be defending muscle glycogen on the day. You know, the low carbers and keto athletes are going to have to eat a little less in order to do that. The high carbers, moderate carbers are going to maybe have to eat a little bit more in order to do that. And, you know, just kind of finding out with your long runs or getting a fat oxidation tests and things like that. So you can get an idea of what your carbs to fat ratios are at given intensities can kind of clue you in as to how much you need to eat or whether you need to manipulate diet or training in a way to improve your fat oxidation rates. These are other ways to make sure that you're kind of staying on top of these sort of things. When it comes to hydration, I think kind of a starting point for a lot of people can be trying to target about five to 700 milli milligrams of uh, electrolytes per liter of water consumed. And you should count the stuff you have in your nutrition as well as any extra electrolytes you're going to add into that. But if you have that kind of that, that, that ratio, you're in a position where 
you uh, can drink to thirst and, and, and then you can kind of gauge if you're someone who's not fitting nice and cleanly within those averages, you may need to do a little less sodium with your water, or you need to maybe do a little more depending on usually a little more is less of an issue. I think, cause you just get, you just drink more and then you're going to get a little more with it, but uh, it is something that's worth paying attention to. You can get tests that will show you kind of like your, your electrolyte loss and, and fine tune that number a little bit more specifically to you versus using kind of population level stuff. But a lot of times most people aren't going to go in and do that. So I, I like to say, start out with five to 700 milligrams per liter of water consumed and drink to thirst from there. And that, that should kind of keep you in balance with uh, fluids and electrolytes and hopefully keep you from finding yourself in a position where it's just that perceived effort is getting worse and worse as the race goes on versus you know, having a few hard spots, it's a hundred miles. You're going to have spots where things are more difficult than the average. You're going to have spots that are easier than the average. And then ultimately it's going to, you're going to have an experience that is your average. Uh, but if you want it to be like a little more predictable, I think staying on top of those things, proper pacing and, uh, you know, not getting into this mindset where you need to bank a ton of miles early on is, is a good way to start with that. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with Zach Bitter. 